Hey, Mr. Pond Boss, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Lusk coming at you live. Here, I guess this is almost New Year's Eve, isn't it? Almost. Won't be long. One more day, and we're, you know, <laughs> another two days, and we're looking at 2020 in the rearview mirror. I bet you guys are ready for that. I know I am. Welcome. Glad to see everybody checking in. Looks like we got 14 or 15 people. I thought tonight I'd talk about uh, renovating ponds. Now, this may not be the best time of year to do it, but it's a good time to be thinking about it. And it's really kind of funny because I've gotten quite a few phone calls lately where people are trying to decide whether or not renovating a pond is going to be the right thing for them to do. And I'm going to take you through some of that exercise and figure out you know, how to make those choices. So let's see, who all we got here? So far I see, um, I see John Funk, Christopher Aguilar, Clark Cole, Chuck Brinkman, Kay Charbonneau. I haven't met Kay yet. Bill Off. I probably mispronounced that because I'm pretty good at that. So I'm going to see here if this thing is going to work where I can see the questions. Jeremy Duckworth, I see you going on. Holy cow, let me figure this out, boys and girls. So, in the meantime, you guys know the drill while I'm trying to sort this out. Click hashtag, or click like. Type in hashtag Palm Boss Magazine. Share it to your timeline. You're eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss hat. There it is right there. Living color. And the Palm Boss mug that Danny Mac, say it with me, knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. We don't know how it knows, but it does. So uh, we'll have a drawing here in a few days. I'll get with um, I'll get with Leanne, and we'll work that out and see what's going on. So let me see here. Let me see if I can click to expand. So oh, there we go. There's those comments. Great. All right, Lathrum Pew. Good to see you, Chuck Brinkman. Lathrum's checking in from over in East Texas near Longview. Chuck is up there in uh, the Midwest, west of St. Louis, Missouri. Danny Max down around San Antonio. John Funk wants to hear about some habitat additions with the something, whatever that word is, that I don't understand. <laughs> okay, so let's get at it. <clears throat> I've had three phone calls just in the last week or so. I got, it's really crazy, I got an email on Christmas Day <laughs> from a guy that wanted to talk about things he could do to revitalize a small pond near uh, south of Louisville, Kentucky. Well, I just saw it on my phone, and after things settled down, I responded to him, and then the next day I had a few minutes to go look on Google Earth. Now, here's what I do when I get ready to talk to somebody about renovating a pond. Number one, I want to know the goals. You know, what's the mission? What is it you're wanting to do? The uh, uh, Why do you want the pond? Is it now this particular guy wanted to have a pond to increase property value, which tells me that he's going to have a finite budget that he needs to spend to be sure that he doesn't spend more than the value he's going to give to the property. The second thing is he wanted it to be aesthetically appealing, so it wants it to look good like a golf course pond tends to do. And the third thing was he just wanted a few fish that the grandkids could catch. And on the other hand, I just I got an email a couple of days ago from a group of guys in Jackson, Mississippi, who are looking to go buy a piece of property that has an existing pond, or should they get an existing pond and renovate it, or should they build a new lake? So I'm going to take you through some of those processes there. So let's see here. Um, with John Funk, you want to hear about Habitat Additions? I will talk about that. How did the cookie? The cookies turned out great. We had like, uh, oh my gosh. I'd show you, but one of one of the kids bit me. God dang, right above my belly button. We were doing s'mores around the campfire, and the one of the three year olds started headbutt me, and which is kind of fun because he's a he's he loves to climb and headbutt me and play. <laughs> he's a he's a superhero, by the way, Captain America. He wears that costume all the time, and uh, he headbutted me, and I let him do it, and all of a sudden he quit headbutting me, and leaned in on my stomach and bit me. So. The cookies turned out pretty good. We did oatmeal raisin cookies. We did chocolate chip cookies. We did gingerbread cookies. We made gingerbread houses, although we didn't make those cookies. 
but it was really, really, really fun. I mean, we spent time with uh, four of the five sets of grandkids. The fifth set lives over in uh, Alabama. Didn't get to see them. We saw them around Thanksgiving. Uh, but my oldest grandson, Ethan, is in the Air Force, so we only get to see him like once a year. He's 21 years old now, so we've got him. We have 12 grandkids. Oh, and we found out another one on the way. We got a little girl coming, which would be number 13. So we did say a little prayer for twins because I don't want to end up at 13. We got to have, you know, 14 or 15 or whatever it ends up being. So the cookies turned out great. Christopher Aguilar just got back from Valley View. Wow, Valley View over near Gainesville or Valley View down near Waco. And if you if you went to uh, Valley View, Texas here at near Gainesville and you didn't call me, dude, we need to have a conversation. Joby says, what's the effect of zebra mussels in a four and a half acre pond? Um, the effect, I would do everything I can to keep them out. You know, zebra mussels tend to end up in public waters and it's not hard to keep them out of private waters, but what they do is they will influence the base of your food chain. They're going to consume your best plankton, and if you think you've got them, I would confirm. And if you do have them, then we need to have a conversation because I need to ask some questions. Because uh, my, my nature is going to be for a four and a half acre pond to use a mollusk side to kill them which that can, that can be done in a small body of water like that. You could take them out. So confirm, identify. The problem is if you've got native mussels that you like, you know, how do you defend those and protect those? So if you've got zebra mussels, then we'd have a conversation. I would encourage you to have a conversation with your fisheries biologist or lake management consultant. You guys figure out what to do about that. Um, uh, let's see here. Drew, hey, checking in. Oh, man, look at that. Well, you're, Drew, you're right in here with this topic, buddy, because I'm, I'm, I got a feeling you're going to want to uh, chime in on it, which I hope you do, because I'm going to talk about renovating ponds. Here I am licking my finger. How many of you gone to the grocery store and want to lick the little plastic bag to open it and put the vegetables in, and you can't because it may have Corona on it? Me? Jeez, crazy stuff. I'm going to scroll down here and look at some of these other questions and things and make sure I can stay ahead. Harrison Davis checking in from Georgia. Yeah, I'm hoping we can have a better new year too. Katie Ferrari Baca. Good to see you, girl. Let's see here. Mud, yuck. Tim Jackson checking in from South Carolina. Clemson, you're going to be watching football here in a few days. Old golf course ponds. Lots and lots of curly tail, curly leaf pond weave throughout the entire pond. Stock tilapia versus chemical. Tilapia will not eat that pond weed. They will eat algae. They'll do a pretty good job of controlling algae if you put the right numbers in there. And I'm going to recommend about 20 pounds per acre. Now be sure that they're legal where you live. Mark Dyer, Willie Howe, 13 is a great number. <laughs> it will be when that little girl's born. We've got eight, eight boys and four girls now. So that little girl kind of gone up the numbers a little bit. So uh, let's talk about renovating a pond. Uh, there, there's an, another guy that contacted me. He's got a uh, Santa Monica phone number. Said he was calling from Miami, Florida, and has a pond in Tennessee. And I'm always intrigued by emails like that and phone calls. So what he's what he, he's, he's a musician, a uh, professional musician, and he's looking for. A, a, he's found a spot that's got about a half acre pond that's probably 40 years old. And the first thing I do is look on Google Earth and I see how big the watershed is that feeds that area. And what was intriguing to me is this oval-shaped pond was built where one small branch of a creek flows into about 50 feet upstream of the confluence of three other bigger creeks that come together. So had that pond been built just 50 yards downstream, I measured it, it could cover five acres. So that particular property could have had a five acre lake on it. The dam would be about 400 feet long. I haven't done the math yet, but Drew will probably chime in there. There's a, a, a seven foot elevation difference, Drew, from the contour where the pond should be down to the bottom of the creek bed, a seven foot drop. So a, a 10 or 12 foot dam would be plenty big to impound about a five acre pond. You know, now he may not want that, but what, what I would do is see what it would take 
to build a new dam, even if it's only for a two-acre pond. Now, the watershed's big enough to support a five-acre pond in that part of the country. Now, it's a little southwest of Nashville, about an hour and a half, and it's farmland there. And so it's not quite like what our buddy Michael Gray runs into. He's he's always hammering rock. Michael Gray probably would be thrilled to death to be able to get down there where they actually have dirt that he can work with. But uh, where I'm going is the next thing to do is I'll measure that small pond, which I didn't have time to do that today, but it looks to me like it's probably a third to a half an acre. So if you wanted to renovate that pond, it doesn't really sit in a good place, number one. Number two, they're going to have to take that muck out and move it at least three times. They got to get it out, truck it somewhere, let it sit, and then spread it out and mix it with the existing soil so that it doesn't flow downstream and mess up the watershed downstream. Now, immediately downstream, there are two other ponds. That are, uh, one just one dam butts up to the to the the other pond's headwaters. So it acts kind of like a silt pond, and from Google Earth, it looks pretty swampy. So my point is, is that if he's got to remove, you know, even two acre feet of of wet moist dirt, that's 3,000 cubic yards is going to take six or eight dollars a yard to move. So if he's got 6,000 times, that's $48,000 worth of dirt just to remodel and renovate a little pond that might not even be a third of an acre to a half an acre. Is that money better spent to build a brand new dam, raise the water level up about five feet, and forget about that little pond? So I think that's part of the decision-making process. Is it prudent to dig out that pond or is it smarter to go just downstream or even just upstream and build a new one? That's the first thing I look at every single time. Now, there's some areas where if you've got a pond, your only choice is to renovate that pond. So what's the best way to do it? Well, I think it's smart to go in there and begin to judge the volume of wet, moist, soft soils that are in there, which basically means a, a bathymetry map. And there's a bunch of ways to do it. You know, so with today's technology, they've got uh, like hummingbird side scan sonars that can detect soft, moist soils compared to hard pan soils. And they can estimate the volume. And then it's a matter of now, what do you, how do you get it out? You know, like if it's a golf course, you're not going to bring heavy equipment in there and try to drain the water out and get heavy equipment with big off-road dump trucks and haul that stuff off. You're going to be looking at dredging. Dredging a pond costs between eight and twelve dollars a cubic yard, and they're going to estimate the volume of dirt that's wet. Then they're going to auger it out with a dredge, pump it some distance into these big socks where the water can drain out of the socks. Now. Silt is about 70 to 80 percent water. So where it gets a little bit confusing is you you may have what looks like six or seven thousand cubic yards of, of, of wet, moist, gooey, mucky junk that could be dredged out. And by the time it gets rid of its dirt, it loses 80 percent of its mass. And then you've got this lit, what looks like a little bitty volume of dirt that you just got through paying fifty thousand dollars to move. You know, where in some cases, that's the smart way to do it. But before you fire up the bulldozers or you cut a hole in the dam and drain the water, do some homework. I'll never forget Sherman Country Club over here, not far away from me. They had a three and a half acre pond. Now, this is back in the 80s. Yeah, I'm, I'm that old. I've been doing this a long time. So back in the 80s, they wanted to renovate this three and a half acre pond. So they brought three guys out there to look at it in the 80s. One guy says, I'll do it for about $35,000. Another guy says, I'll do it for $45,000. And another guy says, I'll do it for six. So I didn't know anything about moving dirt, didn't know anything about heavy equipment, didn't know anything about operators, but I did know enough to ask, what's the difference between the $6,000 guy and the $40,000 plus dollar guy? What's the difference? Well, come to find out, the, 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 the uh, guy that bid it cheap 
was just going to take the dirt and just take a, a, an old cable-driven drag line back then and just go around, scoop it up, cut, cut a hole in the dam, drain the water out, and just start scooping the dirt, swinging around and dumping it on the back side, and then bring a, a bulldozer in some months later and spread it out. Well, he got about $4,000 in and figured out he was going to get skinned on it because he hadn't budgeted how much dirt there was. And he comes right back on, out and pushes over on top of those guys and says, fellas, <clears throat> when I took on this job, you led me to believe there was going to be X amount of dirt. Well, we're only about 25% through it and we're 75% through the money. So we're going to have to have a talk. They said, the guy said, well, wait a minute. You said you'd do it for $6,000. He says, well, I can't. You guys didn't tell me how much dirt was in here. Well, the other two guys that bid took time to figure it out. You know, so the point I'm making here is, is you need to do your, your due diligence or have your consultant do some due diligence with you before you ever start thinking about bringing any equipment out there and moving dirt around because there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. You can drain the pond or you can leave it full. But you you know you can you can knock the levee down, you can raise the you can raise the dam up to get the depth you need and not even mess with the silt. Or you can look at a new site. So what ended up happening on that job at Sherman Country Club many, many, many years ago, 30 plus years ago, <coughs> is they ended up making a deal with the guy to pay him an extra five thousand dollars, pay the repairs on his drag line because it broke down twice, as long as he would spend three days digging out some six inch deep monkey dirt from their main lake. They've got a 25 acre lake plus these six or seven smaller ponds. So they end up spending about 14 or $15,000, took more than a year to get there. And for that money, they could have added another 5,000 to it and built a brand new five acre lake immediately downstream from that three acre pond that was silted in and just take the dirt from the dam, push it into that three acre pond turned it into a swale, and they could mow it. So where I'm going here is there's a lot of decisions to be made, but you got to have good information. So it's incumbent on you as the landowner to figure that out. Now, I'm gonna in a minute, I'm going to take renovation in a different direction. Now, that's renovating a pond to make it bigger, deeper. You know, most ponds, well, I'll tell you this, every pond has a life. And the minute it's built, that life starts to decline. You know, every pond starts off <coughs> with good, clean water, no no silt, no muck. Over time, it accumulates. And as it does, a pond's lifespan is determined by how much flow rate there is through it, how much silt's coming in. A, a pond built in, in Iowa cornfields is going to last a lot less time than one that's built in the Rocky Mountains where there is no dirt. <coughs> but everyone's got a lifespan. Uh-oh, look at there. Katie says, Hummingbird Helix with a mega side imaging. Totally worth the money once you know how to read it. You know, and that's a big deal right there. It, once you know how to read that, and, and it's, it's really worth it to go through the tutorials because you can keep that information and actually create a map with that information. So that's that's good stuff. Let's see. I'm going to go on down. I'm missing a few things. I'm going to pause for a minute and talk about it. Answer some questions here. Danny Mac needs some freshwater redfish. Dude, you need to go down to Brawny and Calaveras and go fishing with that good guy down there. I've heard good things about him. Okay, Joby says, stocking minnows in a, in, in a shiner, minnows in and shiners in an established pond. Well, they establish you just become instant fish food. <coughs> Fathead minnows are going to become instant fish food. But golden shiners, if you're going to do that, do that in March. You know, depending on where you are, because that when you start buying golden shiners in March, they're developing their eggs and they're getting ready to spawn. And they like to stick their eggs on grassy substrate. So be sure you've got places they can stick their eggs along the edge of your pond. Bales of hay, you know, take some uh, coastal Bermuda or even straw and spread it out. Get it in the water a week or two before you add your minnows. Buy them that are big enough, bass minnows. I think, you know, at the bait store, that's what they call golden shiners. Now, to kind of further qualify that answer, if you've got an overcrowded bass lake, they're going to be instant fish food. You know, and of course, your timing is real important. If you can buy those minnows a couple of weeks before they're, they're due to spawn, your survival rate's going to be higher 
from transport, even though it might be lower in the pond, because once they hit the water, they're going to get eaten. Now, another little secret, when you buy minnows, stock them all in the same place. You know, a lot of guys think, well, I'm going to spread them around the whole pond because that way they stand a better chance. No, if you spread them around the pond, there's going to be a whole lot of fish around the pond that's going to get a chance to eat them. If you turn them all loose at the same place, they're going to get a chance to kind of get oriented, get tempered, adjusted, and then they're going to go wherever they can go to try to seek cover. Seek cover. Find a foxhole somewhere. Harrison Davis, does anyone else in Pond Boss country have non-native fish such as grass carp or salmon imprinted on their county stormwater drain manhole cover? I'm not quite sure where that's coming from, but I will await those responses. That sounds good. <coughs> so, uh, Danny Mack talking. I got you. All right. There's Tim Stewart checking in from Okeechobee. I bet things are happening around there. I'll tell you what's happening here. It was 60 degrees this morning at about 7 o'clock. And at 8.15, it was 49, and now it's about 42, and it's raining like crazy. So there's Kyle Edwards. He got it. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine. Be sure and do that. Click like. Share this to your timeline, and you're eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss hat. Any Palm Boss mug? Say it with me, Tim Stewart. The knows how to. Uh, yeah, I know. You're, you're, you were talking to this video. <laughs> how to keep hot things hot, gold things cold. The November, December issue of Pond Boss, 35 bucks a year, cheaper than a Friday night date, lasts a whole year. The January, February issue is in the mail stream, and boy, we got some good articles in that one. If you guys aren't subscribing to the magazine yet, please do that. Now, I'm working on some really fun stuff for Pond Boss. We've taken uh, a, quite a bit of the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology that we videoed, and we're turning it into educational pods where it's going to be uh, available. Some of it's going to be free. Some of it's going to be available. The premium content will be available for purchase. And give me another six or eight weeks and we'll have that. So there's a little tease for that. Joby, Cincinnati, Ohio, turn off aerators in winter. Yes, I would turn off the aerators. Now, I'm going to kind of qualify that a little bit. <clears throat> the only reason to not turn off your aerators is if you want to keep a hole in the ice in that part of the country. If you're going to do that, think safety. Now, you don't really want to move the water via uh, bottom diffused aeration systems in the deepest part of the pond. So I would bring the diffusers in closer unless you're already iced up and you can't. But bring those diffusers in closer to the shore. And if you want to open it up and water five feet deeper or less, do that. Now, they're not going to work real well in three feet of water, but they'll work pretty well in five and six feet of water if you want to do that. Otherwise, if you're not worried about winter kill, turn them off. Leave them off until ice off. Actually, leave them off until the water temperature hits about 55 degrees. And then start up like the manufacturer tells you. Don't just go out there and plug them back in in, in April and, and, and expect everything to be cool because it won't be. Start them up like the manufacturer tells you. John Funk, thinking about adding yellow perch to my half-acre pond with largemouth bass, bluegill, and channel catfish. Any advice? Give it a try. See what happens. You know, yeah, I mean, why not? They're going to reproduce quite a bit, but your largemouth bass in, you know, upper Michigan, central Michigan, they're going to they're going to help prey on those baby yellow perch. So, yeah, why not? If you, I, I tell you, here's the advice. Buy some bigger ones. <laughs> if you'll buy some that are six to eight inches long, six to nine inches long, your survival rate will be a little bit better. Mike Cottrell checking in from Palapena County. I paid that dumb tax. Do you? Yeah, you know what? I... That is something that is just so important. You know, <clears throat> talking about renovating ponds, if you don't, if you don't do your homework, you will pay a dumb tax. I promise. And I didn't coin that phrase, but I've stolen it. Because we don't know what we don't know. Now I am gonna after I handle some of these questions, I'm gonna circle back on a different type of renovation. Ty Rob, what are your thoughts on someone having problems keeping feeder minnows established but have no problems keeping green sunfish and bluegill stock? Bass, bluegill, bass, sunfish, bluegill, perch, feeder minnows. No, um, feeder minnows, fathead, and golden shiners never survive long enough to reproduce. <clears throat> I wouldn't stock any more of those minnows. If they can't survive long enough to reproduce, then you're wasting your dollars. It would be dollars smarter spent on um, feeding the fish. 
you know, if you feed your bluegills, you feed whatever minnows you've got, you know, feed those fish that will eat fish food, then you will increase the productivity of that pond two or three fold. So rather than go spend $10 or $12 a pound for fathead minnows or, or you know, golden shiners or whatever, uh, and they get eaten before they get a chance to reproduce and establish, it's not money well spent. You know, I've, I've told this many, many times on the show, <coughs> fathead minnows only have a couple of purposes. <coughs> One is to promote the first year's growth of largemouth bass in a brand new pond. The second purpose is if you have a, like a catfish pond and you want an additional forage fish. You think as much as I talk, my throat would be better. Let's try some of this cough syrup. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. Okay. Um... You know what, Katie? I've looked at your, I've looked at your, at your stuff, your social media stuff, and I'm going to encourage people to do that. Fishlikeacat.com. She is, Katie is really, really on top of things. She is stellar. I mean, she's got things going on with this fishing business, and she's, uh, she's working on an article about how to read your graph. So you know what? Y'all check that out. Go check what she's doing. She's really passionate about fish, fishing, pond management, and how to grow bigger fish. And even more importantly, on how to catch bigger fish. So check her out. All right, let me see here. David Watkins. We have a 60 to 70 year old 12 acre pond near Athens, Texas. The dam has steep sides and has been ignored. And has some large trees on the back side and three to four trees on the front side. What can we do now to extend the dam life? I'll tell you what to do, David. I come over that way fairly often. Let's make an appointment and go look at it. I can't really tell you here, but here's what I'm going to tell you. If it's got 60 to 70 year old trees on it, don't cut them off. If the back side of the dam is steep, don't do anything about it right now. You know, one of the things you need to do if you want to think about how to extend the life of the dam is to evaluate the weak points of the dam. So something you can do immediately is to look at the elevation of the dam and see how much freeboard there is and what has erosion done to it? So if erosion has chewed off some of the backside slope or has eaten into the spillway, those are the things to temporarily repair until you decide what you want to do about the dam. Now, repairing a dam that's been there 60 or 70 years and it's been through droughts and floods, and if, if that dam is still standing after the floods we had in 2015, it's probably in better shape than you think. However, it is prudent to 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 in, to go inspect and investigate the condition of your dam in case you need to do something about it because things do happen. You know, nutrient will dig a hole. Um, uh, otters, beavers, nutria will you know climb over and create slides and generate brand new um, erosion on the backside with their slides and their trails. You know, cattle can stomp along it and create low spots. So I do think it's a good idea to inspect it. And I think I'd spend a little bit of time with somebody that builds dams for a living. Mike Otto would be happy to come over there and look at it with you. Uh, you can find him at autosdirtservice.com or I think Mike at autosdirtservice.com and give him a question or get, send him a question. He'll talk about it. But I'd be looking to see if there's any damage or erosion to that dam. So the answer to your question is it depends on what's wrong with the dam. If it's made it 60 or 70 years through floods and droughts, it may be just fine. You know, and, and a lot of dams back then on a 12-acre pond were built where, they, where the dams were pushed up without a backside slope that's any better than a 2 to 1. And they did fine because some of those dams over there are not very tall. So I think inspecting the dam would be smart. Get a private guy to do it. If you get a public entity to do it, they may tell you some things you don't really want to hear and cause you more grief than you'd have to deal with. Let's see. Carissa offered Chappelle, am I supposed to be adding minnows to my pond? Bremen Bass, stock 775 bluegill in the spring and be feeding pellets daily. Not really. <clears throat> no, I don't think I would stock any more minnows. If you've already got Bremen Bass, feed the brim, weigh and measure the bass, and plan to... Uh, Watch your bass growth rates, and as they start to kind of top out and begin to lose weight, 
that's when you want to start culling a few. You know, at some point, look at look at your pond like a garden. You planted it, you fertilized it, you're nurturing it, you're growing something. At some point, you're going to have to harvest something. And that's typically, in most ponds, you're going to be bass that are 10 to 14 inches after the third year. That's typical, after three years. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Drew Hay says, Bob, I can't add anything to that. You're spot on, as expected. I just pound the fact. I already mentioned, do your homework and do your research. Don't pay the dumb sacks, dumb tax, and just hire Joe Dirt down the street. Yep, and that's real good. Real good advice. Here's Chris Chavetta. Hey, Chris, good to see you from, from Innsbruck. All right, Tim Stewart, getting some peacock bass tomorrow, Lord willing. Making holes in the ground is for fish, for, for fun. That's it, man. Yep. Uh, yeah, Tim is getting to do some fun stuff. Of course, when you, when you live in South Florida, <laughs> you get all kinds of stuff like armored catfish, walking catfish, apple snails, um, peacock bass, you know, um, all kinds of different minnows, tropical fish, pythons, all kinds of cool stuff. Eric Avery, thanks for the great information every week, Bob. You bet. If someone wants a professional Mr. Lust cons consult, what's the best way to contact my office? You can call the office <clears throat> either at 903-814, and I'm sorry, 903-564-5372, or you can send me an email. Send me an email, boblusk at outlook.com, and I'll respond to it. Now, if I'm hanging out with the grandkids making Christmas cookies, or like tomorrow, uh, Debbie and I, are, De Debbie's got a, 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 a friend of hers that she met when they were two years old in the church nursery. It's really kind of cool because they've, they've hung out with each other their entire lives and both their husbands like each other. So uh, neither none of us have coronavirus. So we're going to go spend tomorrow evening with them. And I probably won't answer an email tomorrow, but I will on the first. Jerry Siebert, contacted Trappers Association, Oregon. Send a guy that trapped all the otters, and now he's going to turn them into hats. <laughs> that makes me laugh. I don't know why, but it does. <clears throat> Ty Rob, well water, does it do more harm than good, or is it okay to keep a flowing well going? Does the iron and calcium harm the water quality? Well, here's the answer I'm going to give you there, Ty. I would do some water chemistry to make sure you know what's in the water and compare that to your runoff water that's in the pond already. Now, there's not a lot of well water that's going to be harmful, but there is some well water that is so heavy with different metals and minerals that it can affect the productivity of the water. Uh, like, for example, uh, I love it to see well water that's got just 150 parts per million of calcium carbonate lime, but I don't like it as much if it's calcium sulfate with sulfur because that tends to create a little different plankton bloom than what you get with lime, you know? And so uh, if you keep the water, I'll tell you that I have a well that's got a fair amount of sulfur, a lot of iron. It's heavy with calcium carbonate, some calcium sulfate, and I don't run it full time because I don't need it. I only run it when the ponds are dropping. And they're dropping when the air is dry or it's hot. Like right now, our air has been pretty dry up until today. It's been raining today. So... I only run that well when I need to um, add some more water to the pond. You know, I'll take a minute. I want to thank Purina Mills when their Aquamax sport fish lineup of fish foods for helping sponsor this show. Also, David Schneiderman. I don't know if he's on here tonight. I haven't seen his name pop up. But uh, Easy Docks of Texas and Texas Hunter Products, Chris Blood, Pradco, those guys, great fish feeders. And Texas Hunter has got the best fish, fish feeders by far, in my opinion. Uh, their customer service is great. I can call them. If you call them before 2 o'clock, they'll ship a feeder that day most of the time. You know, and so uh, without those guys, it's kind of hard to do shows like this. You know, they're advertisers in the magazine, and they're very, very, very helpful. So Harrison Davis is saying, in a typical southern bass bluegill pond with perhaps a few catfish, and other critters sprinkled in, which fish would be considered the keystone species? Well, I'm not sure what keystone means, but I'm going to tell you in a, uh, make me look that word up. I don't know what keystone means to you unless you live in, in Pennsylvania. 
The uh, typical southern bass bluegill pond, the bass are the top line predators. And even though they love to feed by ambush, they also will move around and kind of chase their prey. So they're the top end predators in, in, in most bass bluegill ponds. Now, bluegills are predators, but they're limited by their size and their mouth size. They have a little bitty mouth, so they're not going to go eat the same food that a bass will. And they reproduce prolifically in certain climates. Like in northern climates, they're going to spawn once, maybe two times. In the south, they're going to spawn four times, oftentimes five times. That's why they're considered the backbone of the food chain in bass and bluegill ponds. Chris Chavetta says, our trout ponds are freezing over. I want to know if it's installing an ice eater to keep an open hole would be okay. Yes, it would be. In this case, an ice eater is a circulator that's got a propeller on it that, that pushes water horizontally. So as long as you've got water moving horizontally, you're not going to impact the deeper water. Now, here's the significance of that. Rather than just give you an answer, I'm going to explain it a little bit. <clears throat> this time of year, your, your warmer water is going to be at the bottom. Water at 39, 40, and 41 degrees is more dense than water that's 33, 34 degrees. So that cooler water is going to be at the surface. That's why ice floats. At 32 degrees, water is so less dense that it floats on top of that warmer water below it. And if you think about it, that water underneath the ice has to be warmer or it would be ice, right? So your, your, your warmer, more protective water is down deep. Now, the part of the reason Chris is asking this question is that trout have to have more than seven parts per million total dissolved oxygen. If they don't have that, they're going to suffocate. Well, when you have ice, especially um, milky looking ice or snow on top of that ice, oxygen is being consumed and not being replaced. So with an ice eater that can keep a hole open, that's going to allow water to move horizontally keep it from mixing in with that water that's down deep and allow oxygen at saturation to stay above that seven parts per million. You know, you, you're going to get 85%, 90%, sometimes more than that saturation of oxygen in the, in the water, you know, and replacing it that way. And it's not because the ice eater does it. It's because the ice eater keeps water moving, allowing it to absorb oxygen from the atmosphere. So that's the answer to that. Let's see here. Let me see what else I've got going on here. And then I'm going to circle back to the other part of the renovation thing. Ty Rob says, I'm in northern Michigan and only lose two feet of depth on a drought year in a 23-foot deep pond. The well is very high and iron. I would only run that well. Now, here's what will happen with that. I think here's the answer to your question. <clears throat> when you run that water with iron in it, run it across the ground, run it over some rocks. Don't just dump it straight into the water. Now, I'm not saying it's going to hurt you if you dump it straight into the pond, but what it's going to do, as soon as that iron hits the air, it's going to oxidize and create rust. So it's going to leave a bright orange residue on top of the ground, on top of the rocks. I, I, what I do is I run mine over a waterfall, and in the fall, there's all kinds of leaves and stuff that kind of clog it up, and they just lay there. And that well water runs over those leaves. And then in the springtime, when I'm not running the well, I'll rake those leaves out, pile them up, and burn them. You know, and so uh, it's not that it hurts the pond to get more iron in it because it's going to precipitate near the source and just lay right there. If you were to walk out and stomp through the mud where the water comes into the pond, it's going to burp up orange. Pretty cool word there, burp up, right? Let's see here. <clears throat> Chris says, by the way, try to love the Purina Aquamax. You know what? That, that Aquamax, one of my favorite things about it is it's fish meal-based protein, which I think is real important for fish. And then they coat the pellet with fish oil, which also makes it palatable. You know, some fish foods may have fish meal in it, but they coat it with vegetable oil. That's not palatable. Trout really, really like that fish food. Christopher Aguilar, they froze, and we were walking around in shorts all week down south. Yeah, okay, I, I get that. Yeah, it was uh I was down in at Sun's house down near Brenham, Texas, and it was seventy six degrees Sunday and Monday. What's the day? Wednesday. Yeah, it's gotta be Wednesday because we're doing this. <clears throat> we left there yesterday and it was 
really warm. Well, it's not now. Doug Brown, pellet feeding isn't going well this winter. <clears throat> Three second run time, lots of floating food next day, restarting the feed. You know, that's just good good sense there, Doug. When the fish quit eating, stop feeding. Now, one thing that I do tell people is I do think it can be a smart idea to feed a little bit, you know, because there's going to be a handful, especially bluegills, that will come along and nibble on some of that feed as it soaks and sinks. They'll eat some of it. But, you know, if they're not eating it, either turn them off or cut them way, way, way back. Looky there. Yep. Danny Mac says, horizontal circulation. That's a good nugget. Sure is. Harrison Davis, let me refigure my question and get back to you. I've confused my... <laughs> Keystone. Look it up and then tell me what Keystone <laughs> means. Um, let's see. Katie says, could you combat that with a lot of healthy plants to absorb the iron? Yeah, if you've got plants, it'll take it up. The, the thing about iron is that even if something takes it up, unless something consumes the plant, it's still there. You know, and so really, I don't see a reason to combat it. You know, it's, it's to me, I, I would I would rather see that iron precipitate under the bottom and not cause any issues because it's not toxic. You know, it's not going to kill anything. Nothing's going to eat it. Now, <clears throat> what it can do <clears throat> is it can impact invertebrates, but it's only going to do it in a small area. You know, it's only going to do it in an area that might be 20 feet in diameter from where the well water enters. Uh, I think the, the better answer to the question is only turn the well on when you need to fill the water, fill the lake back up. Plus, I don't know the volume of the water either. Let's see here. Mark Hicks, my cousin, cousin had a pond dug seven years ago. Hit a layer of bedrock at six feet deep and the pond has been constantly draining down. The only thing keeping a decent amount of water in the pond is our constant rains in North Cackalack. Is there anything that can be done to stop the water from draining through the bedrock? We've added over 50 bags of dry clay from a local feed and seed, but still no changes. You know, that's a that's really a hard, hard answer. Uh, and I'm going to explain it this way. What holds water better than anything on the planet? And some of you guys have heard this enough. You know the answer. A bathtub, right? Except for that little bitty hole down at one end. When you have a leaky pond, especially when there's fractured bedrock or soil that's not compacted on top of the bedrock and layered on top of it, you don't know where the little bitty hole is. And just think about it, think about the amount of water that flows even out of a garden hose when you've got it turned on full blast at 15 pounds per you know, PSI. I mean, you've got five gallons coming out every 15 seconds. you know, And so the volume of water coming out is going to be directly proportionate to the amount, number of, of holes. So really, I think, and you're not going to like this answer, sorry, but allow the pond to drain down as far as it will go. A lot of times, they will drain down to that point and that's where they're going to level off. And right there's where the leak is. Right there or slightly above, that's where the leak is. And if you can figure that out, then you can go back in with your targeted products and do something about it. You know, and that may be, it may be adding clay from right there. You know, it may be digging a hatchery pond next to the lake and taking all that clay and packing it down in the bottom and walking in with a sheep's foot roller. You know, every, it might be mixing existing soils with bentonite. You know, it may be ESS 13. It may be, you know, a, a polymer. You know, there's all kinds of products that have applications, but until you can get in there and get information as to where the leak or leaks are, why is it is it because of the bedrocks fractured? You got to fill the fractures. You know, and the best way to do that most of the time is with clay. So the bad news is you got to let it drain down because you're not gonna. I mean, it's like it's like if you had a bathtub with two holes in it that held 3,000 gallons and the water's not clear, where are you going to drop the plug from the boat? And what makes you think you're going to hit the hole? And then how's the plug going to get sucked into the hole to quit? You know, so you really got to get some water off of it to try to figure that out. Travis Paul Smith's checking in from Mexico. There's Frank James. Good to see Frank. He's checking in from the Shreveport, Louisiana area. Latham says, when can you spray to kill fanwort? 
What do you spread? Or what do you, I guess what you mean is what you spray. Um, fan wart. You know, right now is not the time to do that. Uh, Lathan, let's have a conversation. We'll get Kelly Duffy involved in that a little bit. Because we need to know a little bit more about your water chemistry and your flow rates. And then to decide if you want to use a contact herbicide. If you do, then it needs to be actively growing. Right now, trying to kill fan wart probably wouldn't work because it's dormant. You know, and so, and for the sake of everybody else out there, in order to deal with plants, job one is to identify the plant. <clears throat> Be sure you know what that plant is because if you, if you don't, odds of killing it are low. Aqua plant, look that up. Texas A&M's got a really, really nice Website for aquatic plants, Aqua Plant. Check that out. And you can identify, and you can see what your treatment options are because they've got, they help you identify the plant plus they've got treatment options. As we're talking about that, uh, one thing I want to let you know, yeah, soil flock. Danny Mac, that's one of the polymers, soil flock. So um, uh, where I was going to go is let's, let's, let's circle back on renovation. Another way that we use that word renovation is if we want to renovate the fishery. <clears throat> now that's where we'll talk about adding habitat. You know, one of the things that's really, really important, Chris or Aguilar, that's about the only thing good for me and him. Let me see, wasn't there a seven, seven overtime football game a couple of years ago? Of course, there was a murder last year, but let's see. Didn't they play each other this year? Oh, okay. <laughs> Look at there, Katie's putting up that. She put up the, the website. There it is. Uh, another way to look at renovation is, let's say you want to renovate the fishery. Where you go in and, and, and you've evaluated it, you figured out that it would take too long to unpickle the pickle. Like, like here's a classic example. 99 times out of 100, when somebody calls me and tells me somebody put a little a little, a little hot face on, on, on our Cajun friend's little post, oh, we switched it to laughing. Okay, that's fine. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, 99% of the time when we when we check out a brand new pond, say somebody buys a piece of property and all they're catching is dink bass, little bitty, little bitty bass. Well, most of the time those bass are, I don't like the word stunted because fish really don't get stunted. What they do get is too old with too few heartbeats left to gain to their potential. <clears throat> even though they'll gain weight. So a lot of times it's prudent just to renovate and start over. And what that means is you go in there and you eradicate all the fish and then you restock from scratch. Now, that pond or lakes fishery became what it is now for certain reasons, okay? One big reason is that the fish weren't harvested like they should have been. Another big reason is they didn't have the habitat they needed. Another reason is the water's not happy all year round. Another reason is the food chain wasn't managed. So if you're going to think about taking out your fish and starting over, go through this little five fundamental step process. Make sure the water's happy. That means water chemistry uh, I, I can look at plants that are growing in that water in the spring and tell you if the water's happy. You can too. You got to have the right habitat. If your goals are to grow trophy largemouth bass and you don't have the best habitat, not only for trophy largemouth bass and the different sizes of those fish getting to trophy size, <coughs> plus what they need to eat along the way, if you don't have habitat for all that, your odds of success go down. Then the food chain's the next big thing. Genetics is important. And then a harvest plan. So when you get ready to renovate a fishery, I'm going to tell you this. You cannot money whip a fishing pond that sucks. What you can do is you can go back in and improve the habitat to make it more conducive for those fish that you want. So you need to know what largemouth bass need to spawn or you may not want them to spawn. Think about that for a minute. If you want trophy bass, it's sometimes it's smart to not let them spawn because they're not having to deal with so many babies. 
You know, it, it's not, they're not so expensive that you can't stock a few every year. Now, that's idealistic talk. It's not reality in most cases, but it's good to think about. <clears throat> so, you want definitely want enough spawning beds for those bluegill to spawn. One of the things that, that we typically see is crowded bass don't have enough to eat because there's too many mouths and not enough food. But most time people want to blame it on the bass when they should be blaming it on the bluegill for not reproducing enough because they don't have enough spawning beds. So you need to look at habitat to create an underwater community for all the different size classes of the different species of fish that you want. Now, I'm talking to this group of guys over in Mississippi right now that are either wanting to build a new lake or renovate an old lake, but they don't really want bluegill and they want to, great, want to raise trophy largemouth bass because they don't want to deal with panfish when they're fishing. So it's an intriguing thought. They think they can do it with threadfin shad and gizzard shad. Well, if they don't have perfect habitat for gizzard shad and threadfin shad and monitor their bass rates before stocking those fish, then they're going to get to about year four or five and wonder why in the world they don't have any more trophy fish than they do. You know, so when you're getting ready to renovate, don't just think about taking out all the fish and restocking it. Because if you just simply go restock it four or five years down the road, odds are high that it's going to be just like it is right now. So thinking through that process will help save you some heartache years down the road because it's going to be hard to get four or five years down the road and try to buy year two, three, and four. That's what I mean by money whipping. It's kind of hard to do that. So... When you think about renovating the fishery, think about all of the big five things. Happy water, habitat, food chain, genetics, and a harvest plant. When all those things come together in harmony, then you've got a really nice fishery coming up the pipe that you guys can enjoy for years and years and years. Happy New Year's. Mark Dobber checking in from uh, Pentlala, Alabama. Just down the road from our good friend Ray Scott. You check out check out Mark Dauber's Facebook page. He is a very gifted and talented uh, artist, photographer, thing like that. I love Mark Dauber. Haven't spent enough time with him. We need to spend some time. Come this way one of these days, and I'll come that way. Let's see here. Christopher says, does it help if my neighbor runs a dozer for a living, and all I got to do is rent the machine and buy him a beer? I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> <clears throat> well, just be sure you got plenty of boudin while you're watching him scrape that dirt around here and there. You know, I'm going to take a little cough syrup here. Pretty good little red blend right there. Not bad for a box wine. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. Um, rent the machine and buy him a beer. You know, here's what I'm going to tell people about that. I, I, no, Drew, Drew just, Drew sitting here, he just pushed his chair back from the desk and he's, He's kind of looking, wondering what in the world this guy's going to say. You know, uh, uh, I never think it's a good idea to go rent a piece of equipment and hire a buddy to run it. Unless I am 100% convinced that they know what they're doing. Just because, I mean, I can operate a bulldozer. I promise you. You put me on a bulldozer, I can figure out how to raise the blade up. I can make it go frontwards and backwards. <clears throat> I could probably even push some dirt and make it roll over the blade. But what I can't do is read that dirt, figure out what it is. There's over 50,000 different kinds of soil types in the United States that have been identified. You know, so until you know what kind of dirt you got, how are you going to use it, where are you going to put it, there's a great big strategy <clears throat> that goes along to renovating a pond uh, or building a new dam. There's a lot of strategy, a lot of process behind it. So you want somebody, somebody that knows what they're doing. And look at Drew. <laughs> yep, yep, I knew I knew you kind of pushed back on that a little bit. So, uh, uh, no, don't just go rent a dozer and hire somebody. You know, I, I, here's a true story. I, it's 724, I don't want to take up a lot of time with this, but there's a uh, optometrist here that bought some land a number of years ago, and Otto came over there and told him what he would charge him to build a dam. 
Well, the guy, one of his running buddies is a, is a county uh, operator, works for the, our county where we live, and operates heavy equipment, um, you know, motor graders, bulldozers, ditch, track hose, things like that. So he hired that guy after work and on weekends to build a dam. Well, when he bought the bulldozer, three weeks into it, the transmission went out. That was $4,000 to repair it. What his, what his goal was, <clears throat> was to build the dam and then sell the dozer, get his money back, and get a dam for free except for the cost of diesel and pay the guy $25 an hour to operate it. Because that's what he did. It took two years to finish that dam. <clears throat> he dug that pond so deep that he hit a vein of clay that is... Um, colloidal clay, which means to this day, now this was in the 80s, to this day, that pond is muddy. And, the, and he built another one later, hired a guy. Next to it, pond just as clear as it can be. You could land an airplane on that dam that was so big and long, way overbuilt. And I promise you, it didn't work out very good. It worked out great for the operator because he got to work two years after, after hours making 25 bucks an hour. <clears throat> so, let's see. Danny Mac says, It was here that I learned you don't want your catfish spawning half a million babies. Yep, there you go. Frank, Bob, what happens to the extra bluegill you add from a forage pond? Do they just get eaten quickly or do they overcrowd? Very rarely do they overcrowd. Some of them get eaten. But what I like most about adding bluegill from a small hatchery pond is its new recruitment to your trophy bluegill population. So the best of those best bluegills that you've been feeding in a hatchery pond, when they hit the water in your fishing lake, the best of the best are more likely to survive to be the next recruiting class of bigger bluegills. So yes, a percentage of them are going to get eaten, and it's depending on your harvest plan with your bass. But part of the goal is to fill the gaps. If you think about it, there's always a gap when bluegill reproduce. They don't spawn consecutively. They don't really have running spawns. They spawn in cycles of the moon. So when you're adding bluegills from your hatchery pond, you're kind of filling some gaps. You don't fill all the gaps, but you're going to fill some of the gaps from other fish that are spawning in the pond. So you're replacing some fish. You're adding new mass. So you're adding new food, even if it's a snack. And even better, you're recruiting new fast-growing fish into the population that can end up being that two-pound bluegill that a lot of people want. So, let me see what else we got here, because I'm getting ready to wrap it up. 727. Yep. All right, there's Mike McPherson. Um, I think I'm going to start wrapping up here. I Make sure I didn't miss anything real quick. Y'all just bear with me. Uh, you know what? I do love it, the fact that you guys are carrying on conversations among yourselves during this. I think that's, I, I love the interaction <clears throat> One of the things I'm working on now is I've gotten some feedback from people that, you know, watch these videos later because when we finish these videos, Leanne, whenever she gets a minute, she uploads them to YouTube and she, uh, 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 when she uploads them, then people can go find them and I get comments from people. One of the comments is, is they like the interaction where we're talking back and forth you know, where you guys are asking questions, I'm answering them. But we're also getting a little bit of, of uh, inquiries into, why don't you do some more audio podcasts? I think I've got three out there. But I just uploaded some software, and I'm getting ready to start taking like this topic of renovating a pond. And I'll do a, probably a 20-minute podcast on that. And if you've got some subjects that you'd like to hear more about, if you'll send me an email and say, hey, Bob, why don't you do a podcast on this, this, and this? Now, I'll tell you this. Some of these podcasts are going to be open to the public. Some of them, and what I consider premium content, which is my 40 plus years of making a living doing this, I am going to sell some of those. <clears throat> That's part of how I can put a little cheese in the mousetrap, you know, later on as I get a little older and want to do less. But uh, in the meantime, that's part of what we're going to do. Let's see here. Thank you for all you do, and happy, happy New Year to you guys, and I appreciate you guys watching this video. Danny Mac said, this made my evening. You know, just before I went on the air, I did see I did see your plea, Danny Mac, where you were hoping we were going to do this tonight. <laughs> I love it. It's kind of funny. 
Except you have a pool to swim in that's 90 degrees, sequestering with the wife. Are you sequestering or quarantining? I love it. So, hey, listen, I really appreciate all of you taking time out of your out of your schedule, especially when there's football games going on tonight, which I'm pretty sure there are, and uh, taking time to hang out with me. So if you got questions, send them to me. <clears throat> Uh-oh, Ty says, are trees a benefit to a pond or not? They give shade and drop leaves. I think they're a benefit. You know, I don't like the fact that they drop their leaves, but there are things you can do about that. So, I'm going to say goodbye and talk to you guys next Wednesday. So, uh, be sure to check out palmboss.com. If you have questions, send me an email. Bob Lusk at Outlook.com. Adios. Happy New Year, everybody.